Hi, we're moving on to lecture four, covering the second part of chapter three, and we'll be talking about peripheral, peripheral devices, input, output, and storage technologies. A peripheral is a generic name for any input, output, or a secondary storage device that is not part of the central processing unit of the same system. C central processing unit, also called a CPU. On on online <coughs> is electronically connected to and controlled by the CPU. Offline is separate from and not controlled by the central processing unit. So those are just some definitions of what online and offline mean in today's world. In terms of input technologies, we also need to talk about source documentation. Source documents are extremely important for auditing purposes and for um, archiving to make sure that you have the source documents, the source of where all of your input material is coming from. That includes sometimes your old files in hard copy format, printed paper. Uh, we are starting to digitize most of that so that it now in image files or maybe PDF files, which PDF stands for Portable Document Format, <coughs> which can be secured to ensure that they haven't been modified. Graphical user interface is the most notable output uh, peripheral device, and that's usually on our screen or what we call a pane of glass pane of glass represents all the information that's pre being presented to you visually. We have other input devices like uh, your keyboard, your mice, your trackballs, pens, and touchscreens. We also have speech recognition systems. Your cell phone is probably the best uh, um, example of that as you have voice to text capability on many of our cell phones. That allows us to translate speech into text and make it in, put in a usable format. There are many different programs that operate on both the Apple and the PC uh, desktop and laptop levels that allow us to do very similar tasks and functionality. In addition, we have optical scanning that converts text into uh, uh, converts text or graphics into digital input so that you can modify it and uh, redirect it. <clears throat> An example of that is that you, um, many of our multifunction devices on campus, you can scan documents into it and it can produce textual output that goes into Microsoft Word so that you can then manipulate it once you have it there. <clears throat> we also have other types of um, input devices, magnetic stripes that is on your APUID card. It has a magnetic stripe in the back. Really, it only contains 15 pieces of information or 15 characters even. Not a whole lot of data there. However, you may have noticed that all of our credit card companies have reissued their magnetic stripe cards with a smart card that has an embedded chip on it that has a lot more information, especially security information to protect your uh, private information. And of course, most of our cell phones have digital cameras and they are considered an input device very valuable input device. In fact, both Apple and Android have facial recognition programs so you can authenticate. Instead of using a password, you can use facial recognition using your camera to take a picture of yourself or just do an image of yourself and that will um, authorize you to access your phone. And then there's something called Micker which is magnetic ink character recognition. If you still get a physical paycheck down at the bottom, you will identify that the ink down there is slightly different and it has a little bit of a raised feel to it when you run your fingers over it. That is a um, magnetic ink that has been calibrated specifically with the bank issuing that check. Very precise formatting to ensure the validity of that uh, paycheck. The most popular output devices are video and printed out uh, output, <coughs> hard copy, which is also called paper. There are different types of storage within a computer and that we use even in your cell phone. There's primary storage, which is random access memory, and then there's secondary storage, which is uh, 
also random access memory, but can be in the form of uh, additional SIM cards, not SIM cards, but um, micro SD cards, things like that. You do not find those in the Apple technology sector, but over on the Android side, uh, many of the Android phones have the ability to add more storage. In a computer system, there's two different types of uh, memory. There's random access memory called RAM, which we've identified here, and there's also ROM, which is read-only memory. <coughs> read-only memory is usually pre-programmed by engineers and have very specific purposes and functions. For example, all your keyboard input, when you press a key, goes through ROM memory to identify that key represents a character. That character is then going to be translated into machine language that then can then be used to manipul be manipulated in software. That's a very specific use and function. So all computers operate under a basic premise. It's called the binary code. Binary representation identifies two states. That's binary, like bicycle. Bicycle has two wheels. That's why it's called a bicycle. Bi. We are bipedal because we have two legs. So binary is the presence of electrical current or no presence of electrical current. That's presented by no electrical current is a zero, electrical current is a one. That's all a transistor does. It only switches between current or no current. That lowest level of a binary digit is called a bit. It's either a zero or a one. A byte is a grouping or collection of bits, usually in eight bits per byte. Now that, in, in the IBM world, <coughs> they do have a representation where it's 12 bits to a byte. But we'll go, for our purposes, we're going to stick to eight bits to a byte. Each byte represents a character. That can be an alpha, a through Z, a numeric, 0 through 9, or a special character, sometimes. But sometimes um, special characters actually use what's called a double byte representation. Hope that doesn't confuse you. Now, all of this is standardized under ASCII. <coughs> ASCII is American Standard Code for Information Interchange. This is an international standard, actually. All computers conform to ASCII. Then, um, if you remember, the very first uh, introductory uh, lecture we had, one of the things that I wanted you to know was storage capacity. The difference between kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, and terabytes. Now we have petabytes and zettabytes. <coughs> All of them are units of measure of larger, um, from small to large capacity. We also want to understand how information is stored. So your hard disk in your computer operates on direct access mem uh, methods, also called DASD. DASD is a uh, method for obtaining information very quickly. There's another type of storage for uh, data, which is called sequential access. That's like a tape. So for in a tape format, if you want to get to data that's in Z, in Z or Z, you have to go through A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way through the alphabet before you could get to Z. So you have to go sequentially to obtain that information. That's incredibly slow. We don't do that anymore. Tape axe devices are only used for archiving purposes today, where speed is not important. And of course, there's trade-offs <coughs> to storage and the, um, the speed and also the type. So primary disk storage has a higher price in semiconductor memory, which is faster than a physical device like a hard disk or a magnetic disk. Below a magnetic disk or hard disk is an optical disk like a CD or a DVD that still operates very slowly in a computer world. And then, of course, down at the bottom of the triangle is magnetic tape because it's the slowest form of all. Here's a representation on the left of sequential access and then on the, re on the right, direct access. As identified before, there's RAM, uh, different types of semiconductor memory is RAM, 
which is random access memory. It's volatile, it can be changed, and it can be overwritten. Technically, there is a limit to the number of times it can be overwritten, but it far exceeds the life of the medium itself. In other words, the chip is going to go bad or be obsolete before you reach that, um, the level of obsolescence. ROM, read-only memory, is programmable. And there's different types of ROM. There's PROMs and there's EPROMs. Um, EPROMs can be reprogrammed. PROMs cannot be programmed reprogrammed, meaning once you put the instructions on there, it's there for good, you can't fix it. If you want to change the program, you got to replace the entire uh, chip. And then of course you all know jump drives or flash drives, uh, those are solid state memory, <coughs> and of course they're becoming very popular and very cheap. There's other types of specialized semiconductor memory. One is called ReadyBoost, which is a Microsoft product that allows information to be cached so the Windows can access it much faster, so it doesn't have to go all the way to the hard disk to pull programming instructions, which uh, accessing the hard disk is always extremely slow. Then there's solid state drives, SSDs. We're starting to see this become more popular, and in fact, many of you may have some devices that do not have uh, disk, hard disks in them. They may be using solid state drives. They are much, much faster. Um, however, there is some volatility involved in them as well. They are susceptible, uh, more susceptible to heat. They are very susceptible to magnetic interference, and sometimes other electrical interference as well. So there's trade-offs between them. However, they're very fast. Here's an open casing on the left of a hard disk, and then solid state in the middle. You notice solid state is just comprised of a bunch of uh, chips. On the left-hand side, you have many mechanical parts. In fact, the arm that is coming out from the left-hand side towards the middle of the screen right there, and the disk or the platter, at the end of that arm is what's called the head. That head is made of an industrial diamond. As you know, diamonds are very, very hard. In fact, you can, um, with the right kind of a diamond, you can actually use it to make a hole in glass. You can cut glass with diamond. So this is very, very sharp. That means that the hard disk is very susceptible to vibration. In fact, if you drop one from maybe six feet or higher, and that diamond goes across that platter, that's called a disk crash. And many times, the data on that disk becomes unrecoverable after a disk crash. I talked about uh, the last lecture about RAID. Here's how it works. It's a redundant arrays of independent diskettes, that's what, or disks, that's what RAID stands for, that are interconnected. <clears throat> and information is striped across them based upon the different colors. You'll notice that there's parities on either a quadrant or in a diagonal line on the orange on the very bottom and then the blue on the upper right hand side. Those parities are what allows, what allows any one of those disks uh, to be removed and still contain all the data between them. Pretty fascinating and pretty fantastic. The reason why we spend a lot of time on this is because as business people, you want to make sure that your data is being backed up and where it's being stored is redundant enough so that you don't lose any data. Data loss is now becoming one of the primary means of business disruption and termination. In other words, businesses go out of business if they don't have their data. So this becomes really, really important. Here's the uh, explanation of how that, why that is. Here's further explanation of RAID 5. But all of us are still using magnetic tape and optical disks. The reason being is they're cheap. They're slow, but they're cheap. <coughs> this is APU's robotic tape library system. There's two of them. There's one on East Campus, and there's one on Rest Campus. Remember, redundancy. You got to have two. They got to be at different locations. In case something happens on East Campus, we have a backup over on West Campus. Something happens at West Campus, we have another copy over on East Campus. So that redundancy, every organization, every business needs that to maintain operational capability. 
This happens to be a robotic one, so it actually picks up the tape, moves it into the slot where data is written onto it, picks up the tape, moves it back into a slot, and goes down and picks up the next tape to be uh, for data to be stored on it. <coughs> this particular tape unit has one year's worth of data, of APU's data, on it. So we only have to change the tapes once a year. But what happens is when we take all those tapes out, we put it into a special container. That container gets sent off to a special vault that is fireproof, um, waterproof, um, can withstand uh, 8.0 on the Richter scale earthquake, is very well protected. <coughs> that way our data is always uh, backed up and protected. So there's other types of uh, mechanical magnetic disks as well. You see on the left-hand side a typical hard disk, and over on the right-hand side is a, a diskette, also called a stiffy. Here's the internal operations of a hard disk. And as you can see, I've identified the different elements of it so that you can see what it's made of. You'll see the arm that I was talking about before, and at the end of it, is the head. You'll notice, if you blow up this picture a little bit, that there's three platters. There's a head that's operating in the two platters underneath it that have heads on either side of it. <coughs> the data is actually laid down or embedded on the hard disk from the top head down to the bottom head. So it's in a vertical motion, not in a rotational horizontal motion. That's different than a phonograph record that you may have seen on your grandma's uh, turntable. Here's a depiction of how data is uh, stored on the, d the platters. Data is applied to the platters on track cylinders and sectors. You'll see that depiction there, that the track is the uh, round circular, but the cylinder is the up and down. So technically, the data is being applied in the cylinder first on the tracks within the sector. Whew. Hope that makes sense. Another form of technology that we're using um, and Walmart has revolutionized is the radio frequency identification tag. So RFID, you will notice as uh, usually on um, high or very costly items. <clears throat> in the clothing store, it will be a special tag that's put on there, but even in some uh, stores, you might find a little b white bar, a raised indentation bar on some products that the, uh, the clerk at the cash register wipes over a pad. That pad is actually a magnet that's demagnetizing the RFID. As the unit crosses over the scanner, which is obtaining the price, it's also reading the RFID tag to make sure that the tag is going with the right product. That also aids and assists in inventory control. So the reason why I said Walmart revolutionized this, in 2008, March of 2008, Walmart mandated that all of their suppliers use RFID tagging on all of their products. The reason being is Walmart was spend, spending a tremendous amount of human resource, time, and money to verify the product that they were receiving from their suppliers. And they were having to do that manually by counting the case lots that were coming from their trains and trucks from the suppliers. Instead, it used to take uh, approximately two hours for a clerk to verify the contents of a tractor trailer semi trailer. One of those big trailers that you see backing into the grocery stores and into uh, t uh, the back of a retail establishment, right? Two hours just to count everything that's in that trailer. Now, with RFID tagging, an employee can take a specially designed module that fits onto their cell phone. They can walk up to the, the back of the truck and just press a button and within seconds they can identify the full contents of that truck because of the RFID chips on all of the case lots. That is much more effective and accurate and of course less time consuming which is the big deal.
RFID tagging doesn't necessarily need to be a device either. It can be imprinted on the back of a label, as is the case here in this example. And here's a really great picture of a very, very small RFID chip that can be placed almost anywhere, which is kind of scary, isn't it? So this is the same type of technology that we're using with many of our domestic pets where we microchip them so that we, um, so you, if your dog or cat gets lost at the pound or the vet, they can identify you are the owner of that pet. <clears throat> Think about this. Does this remind you of something? Could this possibly be used to be implanted in humans? Is it already being used? Here's the grain of sand, and this is actually the type of RFID chip that's placed in domestic pets.